1861 began, the United States were no longer united. After years of political debate and often violent clashes over slavery, the relatively young nation was about to face its greatest test and tragedy. The fateful blow to unity between the North and South came with the November 1860 election of Abraham Lincoln, a Republican from Illinois. The Republican Party had been formed in 1854 to fight the expansion of slavery into U.S. territories after the Kansas-Nebraska Act became law. Lincoln was one of four candidates for the highest office in the land. The others were Stephen Douglas, running as a Northern Democrat, John Breckinridge, a Southern Democrat, and John Bell, representing the Constitutional Union Party. The Democratic Party itself had been pulled apart over the geographic tensions. Those tensions manifested themselves at the April 1860 Party Convention held in Charleston, South Carolina. Um, it was basically an attempt by the party to make the South feel not left out. Um, the last time a Southerner had been nominated by the Democratic Party to be president was James K. Polk in 1844. The two previous elected Democrats were Franklin Pierce and James Buchanan of New Hampshire and Pennsylvania, respectfully. Both were anti-abolitionists with some pro-Southern views, but again, they were not Southerners. Um, Charleston really was a very bad choice. It, it still holds a record for the smallest city to ever host a major political convention. Only 43,000 people lived in the town. Um, delegates from Washington, D.C. had to change trains six times because of the different gauges of the railroads, unlike the North, which was pretty standard, South was all over the place. And delegates from I mean, the eastern coast cities charter steamships, and they just stayed in the ships and ate their meals in the ship instead of going to Charleston, because Charleston had a major shortage of motel rooms. In fact, the Del Douglas people, Steve, Senator Stephen Douglas, who was the favorite to win the nomination, they actually had a rent out of convention hall to house their delegates. And to make a bad situation even worse, it was unusually hot that April and muggy. And let me tell you from personal experience, being in Charleston when it's hot and muggy is not fun. And so they had opened their windows at night and they would have to listen to pro-Southern, pro-Succession, pro-States' rights activists um, screaming and yelling, often fueled by alcohol, often having impromptu rallies. So nerves and tempers were flared. The place where they met was too small, poor acoustics. There were 3,000 people in there. Two-thirds of them were spectators who often shut out the delegates. And pretty much it broke down the second day when they got to the platform. Um, the northern delegates wanted one that um, basically, that was not too, that um, allowed slavery but was not so pro-slavery. The South wanted one that was pretty much guaranteed slavery protection in all this and it was unacceptable to the North so they broke down on platform the southern delegates walked out uh, they did not have enough delegates to give D Douglas the necessary two-thirds vote the Democratic Convention reconvened in Baltimore in June but most southern delegates didn't participate in the process and would select their own candidate the split would put two separate nominees on the ballot for Democrats. Dividing the vote even more was the short-lived Constitutional Union Party, a political organization aimed at preserving the nation and made up primarily of former Whigs. Lincoln garnered 1.87 million votes, or about 40% of the total. He carried 18 of the 33 states. None of the states that Lincoln won lay below the Mason-Dixon line. A few weeks later, South Carolina became the first of the southern states to declare its separation from the Union. January and February 1861 saw the exit from the Union of six more southern states, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, Louisiana, and Texas. North Carolina, where loyalties were divided, continued to take a wait-and-see approach. In February, delegates from the seceding states met here 
in Montgomery, Alabama, to form a new government and write a constitution. Mississippi Senator Jefferson Davis was elected president of the Confederacy. He was a solid adherent of slavery and of a state's right to secede and to decide whether slavery could exist within its borders. Alexander Stevens of Georgia was elected vice president. Davis took the oath of office on the portico of the state capitol in Montgomery. It's here they also adopted two versions of their national flag, the Stars and Bars. But in May, after Virginia seceded, the Confederate Congress voted to move its capital to Richmond. Summer heat, insects, and other discomforts in Montgomery, along with the appeal of Richmond's resources, spurred the delegates to move the newly formed government out of the Deep South. Southern politicians and Army and Navy officers left United States service to stand with their separating states. State troops and militia began to seize federal forts and other national property within their borders. Events in South Carolina would soon light the fuse of conflict. One of the first things that was the state did was they took control of Castle Pinckney, a small little fortress in um, Charleston Harbor. It was Basically, there was about 20 workmen working on the facility and the, a sergeant and his family guarding at caretakers. No problem, no blood spilled, anything. Some say that was the first act of the Civil War. Um, meanwhile, um, not that far away on Mount Pleasant, um, on the out Sullivan's Island, was Fort Moultrie. That was commanded by Major Robert Anderson, a Kentuckian who at one time had owned slaves. And that is why he was named to, in part to the fort for fill that if he got, if the South succeeded, then he would be sent with sack and surrender. Turned out he did. He was a very dedicated soldier and commanded his post. Um, Anderson also has, in my opinion, one of the most unique distinctions of the war. He's probably one of the few major figures that was clean shaven. The newly formed Confederate government sent its first general officer, PGT Beauregard, to take command of Charleston's defenses. And one of those many bizarre coincidences you find throughout the war, um, Beauregard and Anderson were actually close friends at one time. Anderson had been Beauregard's artillery instructor and had basically become his mentor while Beauregard was at West Point. And the correspondence between him and Anderson was extremely polite and extremely courteous. I suspect it really hurt Beauregard per on a personal level, but he, being the good soldier, did what he was due. Anderson was in a very, um, in not a good position. Moultrie was designed to defend the harbor, not to defend against a land invasion. Um, sand dunes had rolled up against the fort to the point where you could literally walk from the beach up the sand dune to the top of the parapets. There are also houses around the fort, still to this day, in fact, um, that um, look down on the fort. So Confederate sharpshooters could easily have attacked the fort. Anderson was aware of this, so on the day after Christmas, 1860, December 26, he and his men, in secret, only he and one or two trust officers knew this, bore it from Moultrie to Fort Sumter, which totally outraged and angered the Confederate government in both in South Carolina. And at the point in the time, you know, Anderson, he could still go into Charleston and buy food for his men, but soon they were cut off from supplies, it was whatever they had. They took with them. The Star of the West, a merchant steamship hired by the federal government, was sent to supply and reinforce Anderson. South Carolina cadets fired on the ship, causing it to abandon its mission. Um, the Confederates got impatient. Uh, there was a, in early April, you know, Beauregard sent some, dip, some representatives to the fort to negotiate. They talked for hours and Anderson said, well, give me till April 15th and then we'll evacuate because we'll be out of supply. Um, his officers were totally against any evacuation. Um, two of them are, are noteworthy. One was a lieutenant named Jefferson C. Davis, no kin to the president, but later he would come back to South Carolina um, as the commander of the 14th Army Corps as Sherman marched through the Carolinas. The other was Captain Abner Doubleday who for years was erroneously credited as the inventor of baseball. Um, 
so they decide um, so they took the terms back to Charleston um, they wrote back saying we've been ordered to start um, and the note was dead about 3.45 a.m. and said we've been ordered that within one hour you'll receive this note to start fire unless you surrender and sure enough about 4.30 in the morning there's some debates on the exact right time right where we are at Fort Johnson the shelling began on Fort Sumter Um, the first shot, many people described looking like a magnificent palmetto tree when it exploded over the fort. Although maybe that was just maybe a little bit of hyperbole. Uh, however, may, a more logical and accurate description said that it was so bright it lit up the whole fort. And the shelling continued. <coughs> Interestingly, Anderson did not return fire at first. Uh, when he got up at 7 o'clock that morning, he had all his men eat breakfast, then it started firing. Um, tradition holds that the first shot fire in retaliation was by Abner Doubleday. And they continued shelling for several hours, hours a day, and then Anderson realized that he was running out of ammunition. Now, also worth noting is that the, when Fort Moultrie fired upon Fort Sumter, it marked the first and perhaps the only time in the history of recorded warfare that two masonry forts actually fired on each other. At 7 o'clock that night, 34 hours roughly after the battle had begun, uh, the fort was surrendered. There was no casualties. Uh, some de significant damage to the fort. A lot of the wooden structures inside the fort were destroyed. Um, Beauregard was very gracious in the surrender. He allowed them to uh, leave with full military honors, carry all their, you know, their personal belongings. Um, fortunately, there was an accidental explosion in his power room that killed one person. That was the only casualty. And really, when you get down to it, given all the politics, all the drama, everything that happened, the Battle of Fort Sumter is really almost anticlimactic when you think, of, especially compared to what would go on later. Uh, I mean, basically, a bunch of forts fired upon one fort, and then after about a day and a half, they called it quits. And that's pretty much a whole, that's a whole story in a nutshell, really. After the fort was forced to surrender, Lincoln declared a blockade of the Confederacy's coast and called for 75,000 volunteers to quash the rebellion. North Carolina Governor John Ellis's response to Lincoln's call for volunteers was, I can be no party to this wicked violation of the laws of the country and to this war upon the liberties of free people, you can get no troops from North Carolina. Virginia, Arkansas, and Tennessee would soon vote to secede. With its neighbors joining the Confederacy and conflict nearing the inevitable, the Tar Heel State would soon join the independence movement. A fight that most people, both Northerners and Southerners, thought would be over quickly would last four years and cost hundreds of thousands of lives. When the Civil War began in 1861, North Carolina had a population of about one million people. Of those men, women, and children, approximately one-third were enslaved. Compared with other southern states, North Carolina had relatively few wealthy slaveholding planters. Support for secession was strongest in the eastern part of North Carolina, which had a larger proportion of enslaved people and wealthy slave owners than the central and western regions of the state. Um, when secession came, not all North Carolinians supported it. The movement in North Carolina actually began probably in the 1850s when a fringe group of the Democrat Party, which was the Conservative Party in North Carolina, began to promote this idea that slavery needed to be defended outside of the Union, that a group of collective states, slaveholding states, needed to be on their own away from the power of the growing Northern uh, Republican Party. So what we see in the 1850s is an incredible growth in North Carolina. 
the Whig Party, who was sort of the Liberal Party of North Carolina, had brought great reforms to North Carolina starting in the 1830s and really sought to, to bring North Carolina, to make it a modern state of the Union. Yeah, the, the, the derogatory nickname North Carolina was called the Rip Van Winkle State, based on that Washington Irving story about the farmer who fell asleep and woke up 20 years later to find everything had passed him by. That's how the nation saw North Carolina. So the Whig Party instituted a number of reforms, starting with the state constitution in 1835, which expanded voting from North Carolina's white land owning. They also expanded the public school system. They also brought internal improvements to the ports of North Carolina, and most uh, uh, significantly were the railroads, the Raleigh the Gaston Railroad, and the North Carolina Railroad, which gave so many access to foreign markets the agricultural production exploded during this time period. So it was a time of great plenty and prosperity and freedom for many North Carolinians. But this national conversation on slavery and the threat to the slave system made many nervous that this prosperity would be threatened. So as this national conversation heated up, more and more North Carolinians began to listen to these calls for disunion. And many began to believe that secession truly was the only option. But again, in North Carolina, it was a very balanced state. You had many, many more who felt that within the Union was the best place to defend slavery and the North Carolinians' way of life. That secession meant not only tearing up that, uh, the very the foundation of the country and the state that North Carolinians had paid a high price for during the Revolution, and to throw that away um, was folly and bred only problems that could be solved in the most dismal of ways. And if you look at North Carolinians, we really held the principles and those revolutionary leaders to our heart. You can see behind me the, the, top, the painting that is a copy of a very famous one done by Thomas Sull. On the grounds of here at the Capitol is another um, uh, statue of George Washington. In 1860, perhaps one of the most the famous sculptures to ever arrive in North America, the, the Antonio Canova statue of George Washington, commissioned by the state, was here in the state capitol. So North Carolinians not only loved Washington, but the essence of the revolution and all of it stood for, and really uh, celebrated the 4th of July long after many southern states had turned their back on this holiday. So when secession came, many North Carolinians viewed it with a suspicious eye about what did it mean what did it mean for the Constitution? What did it mean for the state? And truly, what did it mean for the nation they helped forge and fire? Even though the Whig Party was no longer a national force in 1860, it still was strong in North Carolina, which had excluded Lincoln from its ballot during the election that year. The boiling point for North Carolinians that really heated up came in 1856. The Whig Party, who had basically controlled state politics and a lot of national politics, had begun to fade on this national scene. The Democrat Party began to really take over, and those cries for loudly for the defense of slavery began to ring through the halls of the building we stand in right now. But 1856 was the time when the first time we see a Republican, the new Republican Party ran their first candidate, John C. Fremont. And this began to really make North Carolinians, especially those, those, those state leaders, very nervous about what the Republican Party thought and what they were going to do about the institution of slavery. So in the wake of this election, we see North Carolinians really begin to be very hypersensitive about national politics. For example, uh, the only uh, professor at the University of North Carolina was actually fired for his political beliefs was a guy named Benjamin Hedrick, who supported John C. Fremont. And once this got out in Chapel Hill and across the state, it created an entire uproar. Now this also came on the heels of a very influential and inflammatory book published that same year. A fellow named Hinton Rowan Helper published an incendiary book called The Impending Crisis of the South. A native North Carolinian used statistics to show how slave owning did not benefit the South and made the point that slave owning and slavery also repressed so much of the advancement of the white people of North Carolina that these two together, 
really began to boil over this idea of secession and confederacy and leaving the Union. On May 1st, Ellis called a special session of the legislature and ordered seizure of all federal property. On May 20th, North Carolina became the 11th Southern state to leave the Union by a unanimous vote of delegates. Many Unionists, thinking the outcome inevitable, had skipped the convention vote a few days before. They chose that day, May 20th, for a very specific reason. It was the same day in 1775 that in Mecklenburg County announced their own Declaration of Independence to leave the British colonies and join the American cause. So North Carolinians saw that as a precedent in their own moving out of the American Union. Now when the vote was cast, a handkerchief was dropped from the window signaling the vote. Cannons were fired, men shouted, women waved flags and handkerchiefs. And it was a very cordial and exciting moment for those who supported secession. Despite its initial reluctance to leave the United States, North Carolina provided a significant number of soldiers and sailors to the Confederate cause, a total of about 130,000 during the course of the Civil War. Several thousand white and black North Carolinians also served in the Union Army and Navy during the protracted and bloody conflict. Even before North Carolina seceded, Governor John W. Ellis ordered the takeover of the arsenal at Fayetteville, the Mint at Charlotte, and federal fortifications. The coastal forts of Caswell, Johnston, and Macon were seized by citizens and state militia. Prior to the state officially leaving the Union, the legislature also authorized the raising of 10,000 troops and cleared the governor to call for additional volunteers. Training camps were established throughout North Carolina, and the production from the Fayetteville arsenal was supplemented with a facility in Salisbury and a number of private companies around the state. A powder mill and clothing factory to make uniforms were set up in Raleigh. The responsibility for readying the structural defenses of North Carolina initially fell on William H. C. Whiting, a former officer in the U.S. Army. But Whiting soon resigned, and shortly after the state seceded in May, defense of the coast was split into two administrative departments. Walter Gwynn, a civil engineer and militia general, was placed in charge of the Northern Coastal Defense Department, which ran from north of Wilmington to the Virginia border. Gwynn found Fort Macon too vulnerable and ordered the construction of fortifications at Hatteras, Oregon Inlet, and Ocracoke Inlet. Brigadier General Theophilus Holmes briefly led the Southern Coastal Department, headquartered at Wilmington, before resigning to lead a Confederate Army Brigade. After Kinston native Richard Gatlin took charge, he continued the construction of batteries and forts around Wilmington. In August, responsibility for the state's coastal defenses fell on the newly created Confederate Department of North Carolina, which Gatlin was appointed to lead. Gwynne was left without a command, and Gatlin hadn't even established his headquarters before a Union assault force left for the North Carolina coast. On June 3rd, Union and Confederate forces skirmished at Philippi, Virginia. A week later, the two sides met again at a fight on the Virginia Peninsula that would be known as the Battle of Big Bethel. Benjamin Butler organizes a force of 4,400 men to march against the Confederate position here at Big Bethel. John Bankhead Magruder has 1,400 men uh, including the 1st 
North Carolina, commanded by Daniel Harvey Hill, the Virginia Battalion, and also the Richmond Howitzers. Federal forces were led on the field by General Ebenezer Pierce and included units from Massachusetts, Vermont, and New York, which included the 5th New York, also known as the Dure Zouaves. En route to the battlefield near Newmarket Bridge, the 7th New York, made up of German immigrants, be laying down at the road. This is a night march. So they have a password, Boston. They also have white armbands. However, the 7th New York, where they see the approach of men on horses, they think they are the enemy, and so they will fire into them. Peter Washburn, with the 1st Vermont, will rush in front of everything, and he'll shout, Boston, 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 and the men say, Was ist das, Boston? Well, this is the first friendly fire incident of the Civil War and results in the death of three men. The fight began with an hour-long artillery duel. Lieutenant John Grebel sets up two guns from the second U.S. artillery, about a quarter mile away from here, and begins firing at the uh, Confederate position. Daniel Harvey Hill has stands up on an earthwork and he begins as a cannon whizzes by he dodges them this way and that way he says men you hear him coming you just dodge him then a shell passes real close to hill and he will wag his finger at the enemy saying you dogs you miss me union forces then launched a series of uncoordinated attacks at one point, the 5th New York took a Confederate redoubt, but the New Yorkers were driven out by a Confederate counterattack. The Zouaves fall back from the one-gun redoubt behind me, and they fall back. Some of the soldiers go into what is known as Mrs. Mitchell's house, and there they pose as sharpshooters. One of the sharpshooters just happens to be Lieutenant Judson Kilpatrick of the 5th New York. So, basically Hill says we're going we're gonna to attack them, and he asked for volunteers. Among the volunteers was Henry Lawson Wyatt, a 19-year-old private with Company A of the 1st Regiment of North Carolina Volunteers. There will be a volley fired, and that volley, John Thorpe will recount that the men all fell forward as they're supposed to during a skirmish line, and however, Henry Lawson Wyatt falls backwards, a red spot in his forehead. He is mortally wounded, and he'll become the first Confederate infantryman to be killed during the Civil War. Wyatt would be one of some 130,000 Tar Heels who served in, and more than 31,000 who died during the Civil War. In 1912, he was memorialized with a statue that stood on the grounds of the North Carolina State Capitol in Raleigh until it was taken down in June 2020. At about 12.30 p.m. on June 10th, General Pierce ordered the Federals to retreat. They had suffered 76 casualties with 18 men killed. The dead included Major Theodore Winthrop and Lieutenant John T. Grebel the first regular army officer killed during the war. After the Battle of Big Bethel, there were heroes everywhere for the Confederacy. The thought that one Southern can whip up on 10 Yankees was proven here at Bethel because 1,400 Confederates fight 4,400 Federals. On July 21, 1861, in the first major land battle of the war, a large Union force under General Irvin McDowell was routed by a Confederate army under General P.G.T. Beauregard at Manassas, Virginia. Tar Heel soldiers participated in the fight, and among those killed was Colonel Charles Fisher, who commanded the 6th North Carolina State Troops. Along with Big Bethel, the victory at Manassas bolstered Southerners' hopes for independence. July 1861 also saw the death of Governor John Willis Ellis, a Democrat. In 
The remainder of his term was served by Henry Toole Clark, Speaker of the North Carolina Senate. As the Civil War began, Hatteras Inlet, which lay between Hatteras and Ocracoke Islands, was the most traveled and vulnerable inlet on the Outer Banks. Soon after the firing on Fort Sumter, Confederate soldiers and enslaved people began building two sand forts at the southern end of Hatteras Island to defend the Pamlico Sound. Those defenses were mostly manned by members of the 7th North Carolina troops, led by Colonel William F. Martin. Hatteras soon became a principal port for southern privateers, who took dozens of ships and cargo worth millions of dollars. In search of an easy victory and under pressure by insurance companies to shut down the privateers, the Union Command authorized the first joint military operation of the war. Benjamin Butler, the commander at the time, brings two regiments, the 9th New York and the 20th New York, down here with about four ships to take Hatteras, which seems to be an easy opportunity. There are two sand forts here, Fort Hatteras and Fort Clark, that guard the northern part of the Hatteras Inlet, one of the three inlets through the Outer Banks that are navigable to ships. The Union ships will come here in the late August. The Union troops will attempt to land. The 20th New York will land pretty much in total. The 9th will land one company until all their ships, all their landing ships will break up in the surf. Stuck here on the island with more than enough Confederates to take them on, the Union troops hunker down while the Navy bombards the forts. So on the 29th of August, the second day of the fight, the Union Navy gets close enough to try to pummel the two sand forts. Fort Clark surrenders without a fight and in fact is abandoned, but Fort Hatteras fights on. Fort Hatteras was defended by about 700 Confederate soldiers, led by Colonel Martin, and under the overall command of Samuel Barron, a naval commodore with the responsibility for defending North Carolina's coast. The garrison was joined by Confederates that had retreated from Fort Clark, which was less than one mile to the northeast. The Union Navy will try to push forward and make their guns more effective as they get closer to Fort Hatteras. Unfortunately for the Navy, that's when they're going to find out why this is called the Graveyard of the Atlantic. The flagship, the USS Harriet Lane, will actually close distance and run up on a shoal that wasn't on their maps. Under the very guns of Fort Hatteras, now the Confederates have the Union troops at their mercy, the Union gunboats right where they want them. And unfortunately for them, at this time, Commodore Barron and the generals decide now is the time to surrender. They run up the white flag, surrender to Union authorities, and the Union troops will take the rest of the island all the way up to Hatteras Lighthouse, 15 miles from here. The taking of Hatteras Inlet was a morale boost for the Union and was one of its earliest victories in the war. The locale also would provide a base for future operations in the area. President Abraham Lincoln, roused from bed in the middle of the night to receive the news, reportedly danced a jig in his nightshirt. After Forts Clark and Hatteras fell to federal forces in August 1861, the Union commander of the garrison, Colonel Rush Hawkins, was worried about a Confederate counterattack. In October, after being reinforced from Newport News, Virginia with the 20th Indiana, Hawkins sent those troops to establish an outpost to the north. Hawkins will establish the 20th Indiana camp at what modern day Rodanthe, North Carolina, about 40 miles away from Hatteras and the main Union garrison and fleet. It's a great opportunity to listen in on the Confederates. Unfortunately, they're 10 miles within the Confederate campsites at Roanoke Island. Trouble began when the Federal vessel Fanny, sent to bring supplies to the new outpost, was captured by Confederates that had left their base on Roanoke Island to investigate the Union activity. On October 4, 1861, Colonel Ambrose R. Wright moved to retake Hatteras Island with his 3rd Georgia and the 8th North Carolina. <laughs> 
north of Rodanthe, the 3rd Georgia will land and starts to press the 20th Indiana back. The idea is to use the 8th North Carolina to come down the Outer Banks and cut it off somewhere beyond Kinnikeet, or what is today Avon, North Carolina, and sandwich the regiment between the two Confederate units. Unfortunately, as they head south, the 8th North Carolina runs on to Gull Island, another shoal on the interior part of Pamlico Sound. And with that, the entire race becomes one-sided. The Confederates chase the 20th Indiana back to the lighthouse. When locals saw the 20th Indiana flee toward the south, they joined in the panicked withdrawal. People from the Indiana Regiment make it down to Hatteras and inform Hawkins, who has brought the rest of his regiment up from Hatteras Inlet. As the Confederates stop at Kinnikey, they can see the dust clouds of the 9th New York coming up, and they know fresh troops and fresh ships are coming up from Hatteras. They about face and start running back to their ships, with the Union gunboat Monticello firing from across the peninsula. The Confederate flotilla was no match for the Monticello, and the southern forces would be forced to call off their attack. The battle was derisively called the Chickamacomico Races because both sides ran up and down the beaches during the fight. Confederate forces returned to Roanoke Island, the Union troops to Fort Hatteras. Hatteras Island would remain in federal control for the rest of the Civil War. As 1861 drew to a close, the Union Navy had made modest gains. But after its defeat at Manassas, the Northern Army failed to take the offensive, despite its superiority in numbers and equipment. The capture of Hilton Head and Beaufort gave Federal forces a foothold in coastal North Carolina. From there, they could support their blockade and launch future operations. That Union foothold also spurred the creation of one of the first safe havens for people who would escape slavery, known as the Hotel d'Afrique. Those freedmen provided important intelligence for future federal operations in the state. North Carolina in 1862 would see a series of battles for control of its 300-mile-long Atlantic coast.